Hi, I am presenting Relational Inductive Biases, Deep Learning, and Graph Networks. This paper is written by a lot of people, mostly from DeepMind. One of the key signatures of human intelligence can be characterized by infinite use of finite means, or combinatorial generalization. We can combine a number of concepts to form some holistic understanding of the concepts, and this can also occur hierarchically. For example, given concepts like building car boy, we can form a relationship graph like this one on the left, and using this, we could do useful things such as generating a scene describing the graph like the one on the right. We can form other graphs using the same concepts by connecting the vertices with different edges. Another example is language. Using concepts like dog and man, we can connect them with some relationship, in this case, the word bites. And we can use vocabulary in a language to form infinitely many sentences. So humans solve novel problems by composing familiar skills and routines or concepts. And we draw analogies by aligning the relational structure between two domains and do inference using the relational structure. Essentially, we understand the world in compositional terms. And this is really efficient because once we learn a general rule of how to relate certain concepts, we can apply them in a lot of different ways. And because of this efficiency, before the deep learning became dominant in machine learning, people focused on structural reasoning, for example, in the form of graphical models, causal reasoning, or symbolic logic. Because using this structural reasoning is data efficient and it was not easy to make use of big data. One thing to note is that these techniques require structural assumptions, and wrong assumptions lead to bad models. On the other hand, deep learning or neural network models do not need such strong structural assumptions. We just let it figure out those relationship structures from training data. However, they were not successful because we didn't have access to large data sets nor computing resources. But as we know now, deep learning models are now thriving on tasks like classification or image generation because we can now make use of gigantic data sets on high-speed computing machines equipped with GPUs. This paper argues that we should add structural assumptions to neural network models. Specifically, they focus on making use of graph structures with neural networks. As we know, graph neural networks perform differentiable computations over vertices and edges, and crucially, the representations and relations between vertices can be learned, not predefined. So graph neural nets can have arbitrary pairwise relational structure. Coming back to the phrase infinite use of finite means, combination of concepts and relationship between them can be naturally represented with graphs. Here are some examples of common use cases for graphs. We can represent molecules with graphs, or the interaction between rigid body system, make a parse tree graph out of sentences, or we can represent a scene with a scene graph composed of objects in the scene. Having this explicit structure helps modeling the relationship between entities easier. The contributions of this paper can be summarized as follows. This is a position paper that argues combinatorial generalization must be a top priority for AI to achieve human-level intelligence. It analyzes different kinds of inductive biases in neural network models, and it proposes a general formulation of graph networks. Let's define entities as vertices in a graph. Vertices denote input data like objects or their representations. Let's say relations as edges, and the edges specify how entities are related. We can also view different building blocks in neural networks as a graph. For example, for fully connected layers, we can consider each entity as each unit in the input and output vectors. And because each unit in the output and input vectors are all densely connected, this is an all-to-all relation. Now, we said combination of concepts and relationship between them can be naturally represented with graphs, which means graphs have strong relational inductive bias. And what is inductive bias? Inductive bias allows a learning algorithm to prioritize one solution over another, independent of the observed data. For example, in Bayesian models, for a predictive model for y given x parameterized by data, we can put inductive bias on the prior of the model parameters data to bias the model in the way we believe. 
Having a proper inductive bias can improve the search for solutions without substantially diminishing performance, and it can help find the solutions that can generalize. Similarly, we say relational inductive biases are inductive biases that impose constraints on relationships and interactions among entities in a learning process. In fully connected layers, as we said, each unit in the input and output vectors are connected, and they are connected by independent weights. All input units can interact to determine any output unit's value independently across outputs. So fully connected layers have weak relational inductive bias. In convolutional layers, the entities are grid elements in a feature map or pixels. They have some important relational inductive biases that ensure locality and translation invariance. As we know, in ConvNets, filters are applied to a local region, so only entities that are close to each other are used together. And in this picture, we see that weights are shared across spatial regions indicated by the same colors. This relational inductive bias is really useful for processing images because local image patches are highly correlated and statistics are mostly stationary across an image. Another common building blocks in neural nets is recurrent layers. We can consider the hidden state and input at each time step as entities, and they are related by this recurrence relationship where the next hidden state is conditioned on previous hidden state and input. Because the weights so for computing the hidden states are reused across all time steps, we can view this as relational inductive bias of temporal invariance. It also has locality bias because of the Markovian assumption that um, the current state is only dependent on the previous state. The focus of today, graph networks, have explicit representation for entities as nodes and relationship as edges in the graph. They provide strong relational inductive bias beyond what other layers can provide because they can operate on any arbitrary relational structure. And they are invariant to node permutations, so they are especially useful for systems where entities are not ordered or cannot define their order. For example, if you draw a chemical molecule, there is no predefined ordering of vertices or nodes. So graph networks support shared computation across all nodes and edges with node permutation invariant. To see why this is powerful, consider you want to learn a multilayer perceptron MLP neural network that can classify if a chemical molecule is toxic or not. Even though these three molecules are exactly the same, MLP requires some ordering of how they are going to be fed into the MLP. So we have to specify 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, or 1, 2, 3. In the worst case, the MLP has to memorize all different combinations of the input sequence. But with graph networks, computation is order invariant, and it can model the relationship between atoms explicitly through edges. Now let's define a graph like this. A graph G consists of the set of vertices V and the set of edges E, and also there is a global node U, which contains the global properties of G. Each edge is defined by the receiver node RK and sender node SK. U, V, and E contains some attribute or feature representations associated with them. Let's take a look at how this graph network framework works. Before going into details, I'd like to mention that this is not a new model proposed by this paper. What this paper tries to do is to give a general framework that unifies different graph neural network architectures. Okay, so this, these computation processes A, B, and C comprises one step of updating the graph G. First, the edge update. Whenever you see the function phi, they denote update functions. For each edge in the graph, phi E updates the edge vector EK using the current vector and node vectors VRK, VSK of its sender and receiver nodes and also the global property vector U. And then we update the vertices. The functions denoted as rho are aggregation functions which takes in a set of input vectors and outputs one output vector. For each vertex, we first use the edge aggregation function rho E to V to aggregate all edges that are directed towards the vertex. 
and the vertex vector is updated using 5v that takes in the aggregated edge vector and the current vector uh, and u. Note that aggregation function's row must be invariant to permutations of the inputs and they should be able to handle variable number of inputs. So rho could be implemented as a summation or average function, for example. And finally, we update the global properties u. We first aggregate all information from vertices with rho v to u and edges with rho e to u. And u is updated with phi u using the aggregated information and the current u. This shows what I described in pseudocode. Each edge is first updated, and then each vertices are updated, and finally the global information is updated. The computation doesn't have to proceed in this order. For example, vertices can be updated first, and then edges, and then u. This is just one instantiation of how computation can be done. After completing one step of updating array vectors, the attributes or vectors have changed, but we still have the same graph structure. So we can do these computation steps multiple times by just having multiple graph network blocks stacked together like this. The stacking of blocks is essential in some cases for the information from one vertex to be propagated to a vertex far away from it. For example, information from this vertex is propagated to every other vert vertices in two steps, but for this vertex to receive information from this vertex, it takes three runs of updates. Now, we want to do some inference based on the graph representation. Depending on the task, we can base inference on different parts of the graph. To get information related to each entity, we can use the vertex vectors to do inference. And if we want to get some information about the relationship between two entities, we can use the edge vectors. And if we want to get some holistic information about the whole system, we can use the global representation vector. This general framework generalizes many graph neural network architectures, which is quite trivial to do because you can just change the computation order or remove some functions. For example, some uh, graph neural network architectures don't have global information, some don't have edge vectors, so you can just omit them. The authors also try to fit in other types of computation blocks into the graph network framework. In non-local neural networks by Wang et al., the inference on some grid location xi depends on other locations xj. They aggregate information from other locations using this attention process, which is similar to self-attention with transformers. The authors show that how this attention process can be interpreted as graph network functions, for example, each grid location is treated as vertex, and vertices are fully connected, so this edge update function is computed over all pairs of vertices, and then the aggregation function does the softmax information gathering. So they try to show how their framework is quite general and can be used to explain many different architectures. There are some limitations in this work. Graph networks perform well for tasks that require relational reasoning, but they crucially need the edges predefined. And it's not easy to modify graph structure after initialization. This paper provides no experimental results, and I think comparison of different variants or some ablation studies would provide some insight of why each component is useful and how it can be improved. Overall, this is a great review paper, and it unites different graph network architectures as a single general framework. But it would have been better if there are some critical insights, such as why is having such a general framework beneficial, and what knowledge or insight do we get out of doing this unification process, and how can we make networks better? So in summary, this was a position paper that argues combinatorial generalization must be a top priority for AI to achieve human-level intelligence, we saw some analysis of different kinds of inductive biases in neural network models, and we saw a general formulation of graph networks.